What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Joining me today from El Salvador are two of the most unique and distinct guests in the Bitcoin space. And I am so psyched to have both of them on the show. Freelance artist Jessica Vaughn is a writer, photographer, and model who's best known for her work with the legendary brand Playboy. Jessica started tumbling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole in 2020. She says that it completely changed her life and the way she views the world. As a freelancer, she's always been keen on making independent choices. But it wasn't until the pandemic lockdowns, she says, that she realized government-run economic systems limited her personal freedoms. Welcoming, welcoming back to the Bitcoin matrix, Alex Svetsky, aka the ghost of Svetsky on Twitter, <laughs> aka Svetsky the Sovereign. Alex is the hope is the is the host of the Dope as Fuck Wake Up podcast, the founder and CEO of Bitcoin Exchange Amber, the editor of the Bitcoin Times, the author of several seminal and influential pieces, including Utopian Dystopias, Discrimination and Diversity, Dumb People, Resistance is Not Futile, <laughs> Why Liberty Matters, and the Rise of the Individual. Jessica and Alex, welcome back to welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you guys? Yo, that was a that was a huge intro. Thank you, brother. Um, yeah, man, I'm doing good. I know. I feel like that should be like um, I don't know uh, some sort of soundbite I use for like the the um, front of a book, beginning of my book or something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Of course. <laughs> Where's yeah. The well, I'm very excited to be chatting with you guys. Uh, I think it's super cool that you guys are in El Salvador. Uh, I can't wait to get into all of that. Um, so just, you know, just kind of starting there, like, how did you guys end up in Salvador? It seems like you're on some Bitcoin or field trip and everyone's there. And there was a permission slip that got you know passed out. Maybe I missed it. But uh, what, what kind of brought you to El Salvador and, and what's been your impression so far? Well, as Bitcoiners, of course, we're permissionless, so we just carry, we just like forged our parents' signatures on the on the permission slip. So, uh, yeah, we managed to uh, get down here, which is rather challenging considering all of the um, pandemic-related barriers to getting here. Um, so, yeah, my first time in Central America—not yours, but my first time. I would I would say the 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 lockdown. Uh, uh, problems not so much the pandemic problems because yes, government response. yes yes we have no pandemic problems um other than the stupidity that um these governments uh want to enact but um yeah i was uh, i was in costa rica and i wanted to do a quick field trip because i don't know just classic verify don't trust bitcoining and i wanted to come and check out actually what the lay of the land is over here uh el zante uh, san salvador and things like that so yeah, I, I heard that some of the guys were coming at a particular time and I just thought it would be better to go with a group. And here we are. There's a, there's a bunch of us here. Mark, Moss, Brecky, Stephen Cole, a bunch of other guys. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a solid group, man. Yeah. Uh, just an FYI, I think the mic is on Alex. That's why maybe he sounds a little bit better. Um, we'll kind of move through that for a minute. I don't think there's two mics. That's, um, that's mm. what I'm guessing. Can we um, connect two sets of earbuds to one... I don't know. No, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I don't think so. Okay. We, we can move through and, and we can just deal with it as is. That's, that's okay with me. So, um, you know, I'm kind of curious. One, I just used to mention Alex, you're coming from Costa Rica. So I don't know if you've seen any differences between Costa Rica and El Salvador right away. And I'm kind of curious um, how different you guys are seeing where you are in El Zante in Bitcoin Beach from maybe the rest of the country in your initial impressions in terms of Bitcoin. Is, is there more exposure... Oh you know, about Bitcoin in El Zante than the rest of the country and, and kind of what have been your impressions of Bitcoin in the country so far? Oh, so, okay. Firstly, in comparison to Costa Rica, there's, there's no Bitcoining in Costa Rica except for like, you know, circles of Bitcoiners who have escaped to parts of Costa Rica. Uh, you know, here in El Zante, there's obviously the Bitcoin beach thing going on. Strike's got a presence here. So, so people are, you know, relatively familiar -ish with Bitcoin, but it's not... It's not some place where you know everything's happening on Bitcoin. It's 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 very it's very early. It's a very 
grassroots or you know maybe no, there's no there's no fucking grass here it's all just mud and you know cobblestones and shit everywhere so it's not it's not a look it's not a very affluent place so there, you know there's some bitcoin stuff here in in the main city there's nothing not nothing that i saw and but i wasn't there for long uh so i don't know it's um i think we sometimes as people outside of the region we kind of get carried away a little bit and think like oh my god you know it's got this 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 but realistically it's a, it's a small beach area with a couple of huts and some places that accept some bitcoin and you know it, it's a start i i think the the big move is let, let's see what happens with the with the enactment of bitcoin as legal tender i think you know the shock phase is kind of over and now merchants and banks and stuff like that need to like get get a fucking move on and do something about it. So it's going to be really interesting how that plays out. It's a interesting game of chicken that Nave's playing. Sure. I, I definitely have a lot of questions around a lot of things you just brought up there. I do want to jump to Jessica in terms of what was your experience at Bitcoin 2021 and what was your reaction to the announcement regarding El Salvador? Um, well, let me talk this volume up. Maybe it'll help us a bit. Or do you want to take this earphone and then that way... How's that? That's better. Yeah, but I'm doing a show right now, sweetie. Okay. Hi, baby. No, I don't think it's best if you join me. Can you go with mommy? Okay. Thanks, sweetie. Sorry about that. Oh, it was so humanizing. Now I like you even more. I mean, fair enough. I appreciate that. Yeah, they mean everything to me. So, yeah. But yeah, what was your impression of Bitcoin 2021? Uh, you know, really diving into the Bitcoin community. Uh, I think there's been a year of transition for you and now even being in El Salvador, but kind of backing up a second, what was your uh, reaction to the announcement to El Salvador while you were in Miami? Um, well, I was just stunned that it, the timing, well, I had been at the Indianapolis 500 the week before um, with Jack Mahler's and the, the fact that he was able to keep that secret from, I, mean, I knew a couple people do after the fact, um, but the fact that he was able to uh, just keep it quiet that week when I'm sure he was so excited, he kept sneaking off doing official phone calls that would last a long time. And I, I get it's all making sense to me now that he was uh, protecting really big news. But talk about self-restraint to be able to keep that one to yourself. So then a week later at the Bitcoin conference, we were just on the edge of our chairs wondering what this big announcement was going to be. Um, and it was bigger than I thought. So um, Huge news. And that, of course, prepped the interest in coming here um, to see it in action. Just we spent so much time thinking about Bitcoin and the potential of, of changing the world that I was really anxious to get down here and see um, what it looked like in action. And um, obviously, it's more fun to come with friends. So I was just excited after the Bitcoin conference where I had met everybody um, before. So. So here we are. And it was it was just amazing this morning to get to see um, they were doing a training demo. Um, there was a batch of kids that were learning how to use the cell phones that we had brought down to give them. So it's just so much exciting stuff. There was no way I was going to miss this trip down since everybody was heading out. Yeah, awesome. Alex, I'd love to hear what your impression has been, especially around your tweet the other day. Uh, I'm not, I believe you guys are going to be meeting with the president of El Salvador either today or shortly or maybe not. Um, nah. Not. OK. Nah. But we're too uh, busy. We're too busy. We've been surfing. We've been doing all kinds of things. We're too busy to meet the president. <laughs> yeah. And what, what, what was that training demo at like sort of strikes headquarters down here or something similar the, to that? Bitcoin Beach, Bitcoin Beach, the office. Yes. Sure. OK. At Bitcoin Beach's office. So just jumping back to Alex in terms of your tweet, like where do you feel or what, what is your impression on, you know, how this is going to be rolled out and governments getting involved, nation state adoption, not in terms of reserves yet. I'm not saying anything like that, but in terms of rolling out a Bitcoin program or making it legal tender, uh, giving each citizen uh, 30,000 Bitcoin, issuing a government wallet, mandating businesses accept Bitcoin. What is your thoughts on on the future of this rollout and what it means for, I don't want to say for Bitcoin, because nothing Bitcoin doesn't care, but what does it kind of mean for the development of the ecosystem? 
I mean, it's a very, that's a very complex question. Um, I, I don't have a strong opinion as yet. I, I think governments have mandated far worse things uh, than mandating, you know, the acceptance of Bitcoin. So I know some people have a problem with that. And I'm like, yeah, well, fuck, you know, they, they, they've mandated many, many things over the years. So like mandating that you should use a sovereign money um, is not, you know, the, the worst thing to mandate. I agree. At the same time, at the same time, I don't know how ready people are, um, you know, and sort of, you know, kind of like forcing people through, you know, through through a mandate or through a law to do something that you know, might, you know, make people view Bitcoin a little bit differently. You know, they might be like, oh, yeah, this thing, look at this fucking asshole, you know, forcing us to take this. I, I don't know enough about the place or enough about, you know, people's relationship with, um, with my, you know, in doing that. You know, I, I think... He's, I don't know if he's brave or if he's playing chicken or if there's a strategy here or what the case is with respect to, you know, legalizing his tender because that does have some significant implications, uh, you know, for people. And I mean, if, if we can prove, if, if the Bitcoin community can come together and prove that Salvador can become a success and, you know, that, that it brings capital into the country and that, you know, people start to use it, that'd be interesting. I, I think... A, that there exists the risk that everyone ends up on the government app on Chivo. I think that's a bad thing. So I would encourage anyone who's running a Bitcoin company uh, to to try and develop a presence here, so that you know people have options, so that they're not all on the one application. Um, and and there is people on the ground here that we've met that are doing work uh, towards that. I I may throw my hat in the ring as well to see if there's something we can do here to, to mm-hmm. create a bit of um competition because co- competition is the the ultimate equalizer. You know you, you never want any uh, from monopoly um, because you know monopolies just suck you know that the incentive to provide a better service or to, to to care about the customer diminishes when you know you have a captive audience that doesn't have another fucking choice right so I don't know it's, it's a very complex answer um, or a very it's a very complex question and I don't have a clear answer to it I don't know how it's going to play out I would love to see people in the country uh, grow more affluent than they currently are as a result of being untethered to the local banking system um, or to the local monetary system and particularly not having to be dependent just on the US dollar um, and being able to store the product of their labor in something like Bitcoin. And I'm sure in the beginning, a lot of people are going to be averse to it. They'll probably dump their 30 bucks worth of Bitcoin to swap with the US dollars because they think that's better. But over time, you know, I, I hope that people will start to put a little bit of what they have, you know, onto Bitcoin. That merchants will, you know, instead of swapping all of their Bitcoin straight for dollars, maybe they'll keep five percent of the Bitcoin, then ten, then twenty, then thirty, as they start to realize that what they kept in Bitcoin is actually appreciating, whilst what they, you know, kept in dollars is not doing anything, uh, fundamentally speaking. So, so I think there's a big opportunity here, and I, I don't know exactly how we do it, but I think it's one of those things where you put one foot in front of the other and we figure out just with that. Yeah. Awesome. What'd you guys think? Of, yeah. I, I was uh, surprised to learn yesterday that uh, the locals have to pay $50 a month for a bank account. I mean, ta- we talk a lot about um, the uh, unbanked community and um, I mean, that's, that's just a barrier wall. I mean, think about people in America with with uh, making way more money. We don't want to pay fifty dollars a month for a bank account. We would just figure out some other kind of way. Well, obviously, it's a deterrent for this community to to stay on banks because um, you know they're not as uh, they're not as known of people. They don't have these long credit histories, so they're not as secure to the traditional financial system. Um, so uh, they just, the banking system just doesn't care about everybody. Um, but Bitcoin is that equalizer. So it was really exciting to see today. I mean, these kids that otherwise have to rely on, you know, the, um, uh, the improbable circumstance of them working in hospitality here. I mean, those jobs are very limited. Um, otherwise they're doing labor jobs, these restaurant, you know, these types of jobs. Uh, and and then they can't afford fifty dollars a month to have a, a something as basic as a bank account. Right. So it was exciting to see these young people today get training on their cell phones to do these um, um, in, 
immediate type of uh, digital small tasks. I'm micro tasks. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a Okay, so have you heard of Stackworks? Heard of what? Stackworks. No. So, so it's 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 uh, Paul. I can't remember his last name now. The, the creator of Sphinx Chats. So it's like a oh. it's like a little uh, lightning enabled mechanical Turk, basically. Oh, Star Nine Labs. I, I have one. Okay, I couldn't hear you because she's got the mic a little bit better. Yeah, I have a Star Nine Labs with Sphinx Chats. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yes, I have heard of it. Yes. Okay, so so that that's what we're setting up, um, or Mark was setting up um, down here. Oh, awesome! What was some of the other, you know, if you could tell me a little bit more about the vibe at the Bitcoin Beach House or the Bitcoin Beach Office, and sort of what people's uh, interaction with Bitcoin there was in terms of, did you get to speak to people, and and was this their first interaction with Bitcoin, or something maybe their their relatives or friends or family had told them about, and to come to be Bitcoin Beach. Um, how do they know to come there and what is the enthusiasm like and, and what is the learning process like? Uh, I mean, I assume they, did you get a good feel for their age? I thought maybe they were 17. Which mm. kids? The kids testing the phones? Yeah, or, yeah. Oh, the kids testing the phones would have been younger, I reckon 15. Probably. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, I'm not a great judge of that. <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, th it wasn't a huge group, man. There, there was some people yeah. there who were at the Bitcoin Beach uh, house, like, you know, it's effectively a house. I don't know if we should call it a house or like, I mean, it's called sure. Hope House, right? Yep. Casa Esperanza. So there was, um, you know, there was a few people there. There was, uh, you know, there was the kids there that came for the first time to sort of try it out. I don't know what their familiarity with Bitcoin would have been. I mean, they were, they were definitely not familiar with the app that they were using. That right. was the first time. But, you know, they, they may or may not have had a familiarity with Bitcoin or a Lightning Wallet and stuff like that. I mean, it's it's still early days, man. That This yeah. is, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, grassroots, man, for sure. Sure. There was, a, there was about three in the demo group. There were three users that were testing the phones that we brought just to um, do. We were basically just doing um, a mock-up about um, dialing in and doing the training session that was led by somebody online um, in what process they'll be walking other users through the other people in the community that are going to be taking these phones and doing these tasks. It's exciting because I, I can't remember the um, amount of money each task brings them, but it's mm. sort of like the theory of like how Uber drivers, if they feel like working today, they can go into a marketplace and, and you know, the domain and, and accept these rides on their terms. Well, these young people can go in and accept this task if they're available to work today. And then they have like 20 minutes to respond to um, the prompt that comes up, or otherwise it goes back into a queue, just like an Uber ride. Mm. So it's really, it's really cool because they, it doesn't have to interfere with anything important going on in their life. If they're available, great. They get paid by the task, so they don't have to wait. It doesn't get tied up. Um, it, because they're paid in, in Bitcoin, they don't have to um, have that $50 a month bank account. Right. They don't have to have, you know, three week rolling weights for their checks. It, this is this is something that could could really liberate people and remove the middleman. I mean, I don't know why the government needs to know what nominal tasks you do on your phone that you might get rewarded for financially. I don't understand why that's some some hard line that we aren't figuring out a way to work around. So. Yeah, very it's, cool. Yeah, it's exciting. It's somebody had to go first, and uh, you know, El Salvador was smart to enact it because it's historical at this point. Nobody yeah. wants to be last. <laughs> well, we always need first movers, and, and you know, kind of thinking about transition and the last year. What has it been like for you, Jessica? This journey from you know uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago to now, and, and uh, what kind of, has this been? A year of reinvention or a year of reassembly? And, and is there a difference? Um, well, uh, the, the lockdown, so it's been 16 months of reinvention, but not before you had to tear yourself down and, and basically everything I ever believed was turned on its head. Um, you know, the up looks down, down looks up, these types of things. Uh, everything that I ever believed, I'm basically running back through, um, consciously with new eyes about my perspective about government and society and influence in the media and all these things. So it's not only been reorienting, it's it's just been um, you know restructuring every way imaginable. But it 
but who I feel like I'm so privileged because of living in LA. I was, I feel like only maybe New Yorkers could relate entirely to um, people in LA because I'll try to talk to people in the country who've been uh, otherwise just less um, uh, consequented for their, the policies of their leaders. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful because it got my attention and what else, like sometimes I think I'm smart and then I think about what personal invitation I had to have to give at the program and get red filled and realize the same thing that so many people around me have tried to explain to me my whole life. Yeah. Has, has there been a notion of betrayal this year for you? Oh, uh, well, that was definitely 2020. And so there's no way that the Democratic Party could ever earn back vote. Um, I feel completely alienated. And so betrayal definitely fuels my fire and is what I'm getting red pilled is what pushed me into getting orange pilled. So it's what ushered me into Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the only productive thing that I found. Mm. And with a community, I felt like I could, I, I could join and work towards solutions to all the problems that I now am so vividly aware of. Because it's, it can be a dark place. A lot of people don't want to get red pill because they don't want to believe those things about the nature of government and the power structures and um, the media, these kinds of things. So it's a red pill is a hard swallow. Orange pill was much um, more pleasant because yeah. they're doing great things. Yeah, orange pill is like a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a rationally optimistic pill to swallow. That, that's the thing. So, so that there is actually a solution. I think one of the things that frustrates me with, you know, you, you can always tell, you know, the level of IQ or intelligence, I guess, of, um, you know, people based on almost, I mean, these days, you know, the, 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 the red or the conservative is like so much more intelligent than the, the morons on the other side of the fence. But unfortunately, they, they, they you know, they, they don't make their situation any better. And in fact, they end up, you know, making it worse for themselves with, you know, that they, they always find their way back to the only way to fix this is to you know have a government enact some sort of regulation or some sort of stupidity so so bitcoin is bitcoin seems to be the only thing that says look we don't know how to solve everything but all the problems seem to originate upstream by breaking the incentive or or, or the or the means via which humans measure time you know energy and natural resources when you fuck with that all the stuff downstream starts to derange and and sort of like in any complex system you get these harmonic effects you know these, these feedback loops which in a complex system they're called positive feedback loops but they have a negative uh, outcome uh, as these things start to find confluence all of the stupidity start to find confluence because of their upstream cancer we get to we are seeing the tail end of extraordinary like derangement like i, I was just telling the guys earlier you, you weren't there um australia was it was this was on the news right mm -hmm. there is a drug company in australia that the, the news was saying there's a new drug company in australia that is um being praised for working on a drug that will help you avoid dying from the covid vaccine Wow. I swear to God. <laughs> Solutions to problems we can just avoid by not taking the vaccine if you don't want to. It's fucking ah. wild. But th this is this is all a outcome of fiat cancer. Like you break that like in, in a on a Bitcoin standard. And I did, I did this podcast with a young kid who you should probably interview. He's he's, uh, he's a young guy, he's a British guy, and he's he's got a show called Not the BBC, and he's like mm. I fucking hate uh, you know where the world's gone, and you know I want to you know talk about truth, but. You know, he, he and I were having this discussion. I said, look, on a Bitcoin standard, you cannot have lockdowns. The only reason a lockdown can exist is because mm. a government can fraudulently fund itself. It socializes the economic loss of that decision on, you know, on future generations through borrowing. Um, it will at some point increase taxation and fundamentally it'll print its way out which we don't see the impact of initially mm. so it, it can it can run a economic fraud such that the consequence of a bad decision is not visible to the people initially on a bitcoin standard you lock a fucking economy down 
you can't bail yourself out, people will be fucking rioting in the streets because they're dying of starvation straight away. You can't fucking do it. So, so, so this is why when you have, when you have economic fraud ingrained in the very essence of the system, you can pull all sorts of shenanigans. You know, like an airline who is supposed to service me mm-hmm. in flying from A to B mm-hmm. is more interested in suffocating me than fucking taking me from A to B. And they don't care about the customer because they don't really give a shit about making money from airfares. If they go bankrupt, they'll run over to daddy government who will bail them out and they bail them out with my fucking money. Yeah. It, it is so wrong. And, and, and because we have the money printer, the U.S. has essentially paid off everybody else to, you know, go along with their with their charade, so that there's no uh, contrast. We can't look at other nations and 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 think about how to compare. What an what's alternative? Going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and so and and so we just recently have been paying attention to the, you know, um, congressional bills where we're sending you know tens of millions of dollars to small nations with with ridiculous labels and reasons and explanations to why when we needed our money the most and I mean memorable history that we sent it off to Bangladesh for you know women's studies or whatever and, and, you know the, all these types of social issues but it's really just because there are people who believe that because we have the printer we should go change the nature of the world and and that obviously can't be our responsibility just like it can't be our responsibility to police the world just because we have military powers like that can't be our task either so at the very least if we just end the fed and take the printer away they can't do any of this stuff because they can't financially incentivize playing along with their charade yeah i hear you in terms of, I'd love to turn more towards community and a little less towards economics for the moment. And as Jessica, like, do you think that we're moving? Because I think that you're very good at, at community building and networking. And I think it's very important to you and that you choose, it seems that you choose your company carefully. Do you think we're going to a place where we're going to be moving more towards decentralized communities and they're going to be uh, a lot of variability? Or is it going to be more like uh, we're going to move through these times and go back to the way things used to be and we'd be more of a cohesive society? Or, or and what I'm getting at here is do you think humanity is forking and, and whether reality is breaking here and whether we're ever going to come back, you know, from this disconnect that we're going through right now? Well, I think uh, the veil has been lifted for so many of us and we're doing nothing in the US except for balkanizing by uh, my assessment of it. And and they're, they're, we're just two sides at war with each other. And now they've successfully made us um, view each other as, as enemies to each other based on these arbitrary things, you know, like identity politics and um, how you vote. And I remember being a young person, we didn't necessarily even know people's um, religious inclinations or their or their political preferences. And now you can't get around it because everybody is wearing it on their body and, and, and um, everything about the mute, you know, just the fact that if I walked into somebody's home and they have CNN on, I know that that isn't the house that I want to be in. And maybe that makes me part of the problem, but also now, Niche culture is um, one thing that's risen up for me because I culturally detoxed on purpose to get it all out of me once I realized what was happening and the uh, elaborate methods that mainstream society will go to um, build reality around everybody in the U.S. Uh, And I wanted to detox and get free from all of that. So I don't watch any network TV. I don't even stream shows that are, you know, have high production value. Um, So that's the big reason why I, um, you mentioned my interest in community building. So instead of dealing with the macro problems and this whole thing that I can have no real effect on, I decided to just leave it all and very intentionally add certain um, people. Uh, My attention is very valuable to me and and you know there's there's a pie chart of our awareness and our attention that's available to us and so i stopped giving big chunks of it to this big machines of 
government and media and all these things. So I make all of these determinations on an individual basis. Um, so uh, my life looks very different. My interest looks very different. I live in Hollywood and, and was pursuing a career there and, you know, I had been for a decade and now I've, you know, lit all that on fire and don't ever plan to go back to it because I don't want to be a part of something that I determined that was, is quite honestly evil. Was that a turning point? For, oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, go ahead. It, it, was that a turning point for you in terms of living in Hollywood? And and I'm getting more here when I talk about media and culture, not mainstream news, but just movies, TV. And it, it, you earlier said that you don't, you know, you turned off a lot of high production type TV. And I heard you mention on Pops, Pomp's podcast that, you know, movies have been priming us for sort of like a right wing authoritarian totalitarianism takeover. And, you know, it, it seems like more. Uh, the other one in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So but, like, I'm, I'm kind of so curious. Never see it coming, the left wing takeover. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious what, what you make of that and just in terms of, of culture, media, movies, television, and what it's been priming us for and the effect uh, psychologically on people? Well, they've uh, been shown example, like think about like V for Vendetta, for instance. I mean, so that's all coming to life, um, you know, loops in a kind of plot line. But they always told you it would be this fascistic takeover of the right and you have to worry about another Hitler, this type of thing. So we were, so our guard is intentionally mm -hmm. for, you know, a hundred years has been directed towards believing that it's going to come from this, this other side, and it's not currently manifesting in that kind of way, but it is here, but it's, it's you know, left-wing totalitarianism. We, we weren't trying to look for it. Do you think that was by design? So fucking true. So true. I, I don't know if, I mean, do you think it was by design? Do I think it was what? By design. Uh, I do, but I also believe it's a, it's a reflection of the uh, society that's set up around us. Because remember, uh, you're blue pilled by default, or at least I was, and I believe that everybody else is um, around me that I that I know. I wasn't even offered like but like. Do you notice that like left leaning people don't even understand our reference all the time about taking the pill? Is because you you didn't actually take a blue pill. You just defaulted in it's right wing language. To, dis to describe what's going on about the choice and what side you're on. Um, but, but you don't make that choice. You're born into it, just like the nature of government. You're born into a big government. You didn't pick it. You didn't pick the blue pill. Right. Society is structured in this way. They take your kids in public school and they fill their heads with whatever they want and the television is another form of the same thing. And so people don't understand their influences at all, which is why I wanted to detox from anything and everything and just handpick and select. Social media is fun because you get to select everybody that gives you input for the most part. I mean, who you follow and who you listen to on a podcast, these types of things are controllable. But you're not, you don't have any of those constraints with the, the big athletes and the, you know, any any of the things the musicians all of this like you don't have anything to do with that when you're just thrust into the culture taking mainstream media yeah i i wanted to just add as well the um i i'm i'm never i'm not much of a conspiracy theorist guy although i might sound like it'll come off like that you know to many people but you know i, I always try and look at how complex systems um evolve, adapt, and derange based off particular inputs or particular incentive structures. So in many ways, because of the attempt of, you know, fascism and the sort of the, sort of the, the right wing atrocities that occurred 70, 80 years ago, I think initially the, 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 the pendulum swung as a way to say, look, that was really fucking bad and we're never going to do that again. And I think the original intention was to, you know, create content to show we should never do that again. And over time, what it created was a cognitive bias in these institutions that were effectively the content creators of the days gone by. You know, the content creation is different now, but the content creators of the days gone by, you know, the newspapers and Hollywood and that kind of stuff were attempting, like they, they were 
attempting to show the atrocities of the time. So I think there was an innocence about that in the beginning, mm. but that over time through cognitive bias, through reinforcement created such a gap for something else to come in that, you know, you, they probably, many of them, I mean, I'm sure there's some fuckwits out there who actually genuinely are evil scum that, you know, want to do bad, but I actually think many of them think that they're doing the right thing. They genuinely think that they're doing the right fucking thing. And, and that is, you know, useful. They call them useful idiots. I call them useless idiots, but like the, 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 the genuinely the lemmings that enable, um, you know, the, they walk right off the cliff and they fucking drag everyone else down with them. So it's, um, and that might tie into the previous point about like communities. I, I actually think, you know, oneness and togetherness and, you know, we're all part of, you know, the human species, I think is the most ugly, abhorrent, disgusting idea on the face of the planet. We're all fucking different. We don't all have to like each other. Um, you know, humans are tribal by nature and there's nothing wrong with that. Tribalism is a beautiful fucking thing. I have friends that I like and, you know, that's my friendship circle. That's my community. That's my people. It's and beautiful when you opt into it. That's it. That's it. You know, but but see what what the what the left tries to do, what you know, the, these idiots try and do basically is they try and fucking slap you with a fucking label, enforce the label, and then try and have you know, you, you're not an individual anymore. You are part of a group, um, and the group determines whether you are a good individual or a bad individual, um, irrespective of what you do, what you believe, how you behave, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas you know, tribes are naturally emergent phenomena, which come about as a result of self-selection. When you're at school, you as a group come together, you find friends. That, that's what human beings naturally do. Like all of us here, we found ourselves through common, you know, likes, common values yeah. on a fucking internet app. And we're here, at this, you know, in some random beach in some random Central American country. Like that is self-selected. That's so, so, human beings form groups anyway we don't need someone to fucking place us in a group based on you know whether we have i'm sorry i'm going to swear but a vagina or a dick um you know or what color our skin is or what fucking you know god we pray to like all of that shit is irrelevant like human beings align around individual values that we share and they're the groups they're the tribes that you know emerge from that and i believe that bitcoin is a force of fragmentation localization and and the re-emergence of you know smaller smaller communities and city states and tribes effectively um and away from this whole globalist push of you know we're all the same we're all in this together you know we're all fucking drones that you know a couple of puppet masters want to pull the strings for yeah it's very interesting uh i i love decentralized tribes and the smaller the group the better uh you know before my wife and kids i i you know i could just be with me or my friends or a couple friends. And now it's just my wife and kids. It's awesome. Uh, and what I'm really getting at though, is that, you know, there's this mentality of like, uh, you know, you utopias, you know, create dystopias and, you know, father knows best and sort of identity politics. But on the other hand, all I see is the greatest roll up of power in, in human history. 100%, and, yeah. and, and I, I really struggle with where this is going uh, you know, when I read your writing, Alex, I think about the rise of the individual and the tools at our hand, Bitcoin, Sphinx Chat, Lightning, and, and, and the ability for, for some of us who, who, who want to take advantage of these tools and, and want to get on a plane, maybe we can even go anywhere we want and meet space. Um, but I really worry about, you know, uh, whether this roll up of power is permanent. Uh, in, in my lifetime, everything I've seen, though, every war that's been fought, the war on drugs, the war on terrorism, you know, now I, I, I kind of call this the war on germs, hasn't really, they've never been rescinded and we've mm -hmm. never really gotten rights back. Uh, I'm still taking off my shoes at the airport. I don't know why, you know, and <laughs> so it, it's, yeah, so I'm not sure if we're splitting off and we never get any rights back. Like, no. They never relinquish control. Like if you said about 9-11 response, like response. Well, the only the only thing is we're looking at it on a smaller, small time scale. So, so unfortunately for us as individuals. I hear you. 
the 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 our lifetime is too small a time span or or, or it, the only wild card we've got now though is bitcoin changes everything because it's such an accelerant like when you have the specter of economic reality uh sitting against you know the decisions and 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 getting stronger as other bad decisions are being made and this harmonic effect that's happening like you know again if i reference complex systems and the way they function you you create a small disturbance at one end of the complex system you know at the beginning you don't see the harmonic effect you know it, it starts to build and to build and to build and to compound and then at some point toward the end where where you have the destruction of the system the the swings get so fucking wild and there is nothing you can do to stop that shit and and my guess is that you know bitcoin is actually an, an effect almost of the disruption of you know normal human action to the point where you know the, the existing system is going to start to fall apart and break apart a lot quicker than what we expect so what's going to happen is decades are going to compress into years years are going to compress into weeks weeks are going to compress into days like everything's going to accelerate at a faster and faster pace um as the system loses control as it as it as its integrity starts to break apart so yes the intent for all of these laws and all of these restrictions is to make them permanent um but each one of these new things that they impose on the system to make permanent is actually another um it's it's another accelerant to this harmonic uh breakdown of the integrity of the structure that we're in um well, because what woke me up was them overplaying their hands so aggressively and it was i mean i had always uh voted blue and as soon as i saw things that were chipping away at my idea that both sides were equally playing fair i was like but it just being a fair person it activated so much um just displeasure that one side was using all these sneaky underhanded manipulative ways to get what it is that they wanted and even though that was what i thought i wanted at the time um what i didn't want was to uh, I mean, I grew up in Kansas with a lot of conservatives everywhere I went because I felt differently about some things that they that sent me off in a different path in life. Mm. Uh, didn't mean that I ever demonized and awful, awfulized them. And I think that's what saved me and allowed me to be willing to walk away from the Democratic Party and know that they'll never get me back because they're deceptive. If you're deceptive and it is what I want, I still don't want anything to do with you because it's wrong and terrible and I don't allow that kind of tactic in myself. So it went against my deeper truths that spend way beyond anything about politics. It's just basic treatment about um, yeah, it's just basically honesty. being an asshole just, or not. I'm not a slime ball, so why would I do slime ball tactics and why am I going to vote for slime balls? I can't do it. It went against my ethics, and but I had to see it. And so what's happening um, is, is that that's what pushed Bitcoin onto me was the fact that they are doing all these um, overly aggressive power moves. And I think that our um, interests are growing every day by more and more people seeing that. Is if they're fair people who have any shared values at all about honesty and fairness and uh, ethics of, about choosing truth, which I that's our that's our shot. Is is that if people actually do value freedom and truth, which are my two highest values and also yours to my uh, understanding. But, yep, 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 spot on. But yeah. if we can't, if we can't find each other, like through this, we're not going to. So I'm really hoping 100% that we do. And aggressive government is going to be the thing that makes small government more appealing to more people. We're going to see that mm -hmm. that's the only alternative. Yeah, I agree with a lot, you know, what you said, you know, in terms of the two parties, um, you know, I grew up liberal and progressive. Uh, I, I think both parties are inconsistent on their platforms or their views. I think both parties are bullshit. I think they're both owned by the same team. I, I think they're used against us as a pendulum swing to confuse us and create anger. Uh, I think most of us, all of us would agree we want a better future for the next generation, our children, whatever that means to people. I think we could all agree on that. And so I tried to, uh, you know, I just, I think I, I like just getting out of the system, opting out of that system completely and, and 
I don't see any value or, or solution in that system. And, and kind of what I'm getting at there is, you know, I, I recently had Hass McCook on the show. Uh, and the reason I bring that is Fetsky, you would name drop by him as a true believer. And, you know, Adam Meister was recently on the, stro- on the show and he, he talks about like where he doesn't see things uh, necessarily as everyone else does, or I'm not speaking right for some other people do where, you know, I, I sometimes think about or dream about Bitcoin is destroying the current system and moving through this period of turbulence into a Bitcoin standard. He sees it more as, you know, coexisting and you'll just opt out and live in the Bitcoin overlay, which I think where is where, Alex, you've been living for the last several years already. Uh, if these systems are coexisting now, you've already opted out and you're just. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, what I, I kind of want to get to with Jessica, though, is whether Bitcoin has changed you and from a psychological perspective, uh, has it changed you at all or the way you see things? Uh, well, nothing was going to make me care about economics other than this mm-hmm. terrible crisis that we're in. Um, like you said, back to overly aggressive playing your hand. Like when, when before I realized that printing all this money, like it, in the last, I don't know, 14 months, we printed like 35% of all the money that's ever existed. That's a, that's a, such a blatant abuse of, of our position in the world that of course Bitcoin was the solu- is the solution to that because nobody can do that. The, the supply is fixed. And so it's perfect in that solution. So before, uh, so Bitcoin not only, I guess reverse engineered my discovery of problems because people will make such compelling cases once I bought Bitcoin. Um, the inflation and the abuse of the money, money printing was definitely one of the main reasons because I, it consequence savers when they do that. Why would savers, people with self-discipline, who already negotiated their rate with their employer, like why is it okay to print more money and to live down their savings, especially because that's that's like retired people a lot of times, like retired older people, you know, like it, the people who who, who made good choices. Like yeah. you're, you're punishing the people who made good choices. And that's awful. It goes against my values. Those people have the self-discipline to make good choices. They, that's the reward is the security of their savings. Yeah. So Bitcoin, um, so that was my initial reason for, for buying it because it felt like a solution to those things that went, were going so greatly against my value that I, had, uh, that I had never really considered until I saw it in the last 16 months. Um, but Bitcoin taught me through people's defense of Bitcoin or advocacy for Bitcoin. I learned um, a lot about economics and, and a lot of this, things that didn't really necessarily have to do with Bitcoin but it broadened my perspective in such a way. So um, I tell people, I'll find like one reason why they should buy Bitcoin that really resonates with whatever concerns they have about the world. And then I'll say, well, what's gonna happen is, is now you have some skin in the game. Even if you just have like $500 of Bitcoin or something, now you have skin in the game and a real interest, a vested interest to go deeper into this. And uh, that just was my path to learning and caring about it. So sure, it's definitely changed who I am as a person. But now it's also, the orange pill is also inseparable from the red pill for me because of the accelerated effects of both of them. I mean, I only bought Bitcoin in March and I mean, it changed my life in a lot of ways. So it certainly changed my thinking and my behavior. And now savings is fun because I'm saving it in hard money instead of like money that's, I don't know. I guess it's like the the it's 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 interesting to me because earning in in U.S. dollars, I I really I'm not hypnotized by stuff. I'm not really a materialist, um, so I couldn't necessarily be incentivized the same kind of way um, to do certain you know money money motivates people to to labor and to create and invent and all of this. Um, but but now I'm like listening to these young people and their access to Satoshi is like uh, doing, uh, you know, nominal tasks. And I'm like, man, that sounds kind of good. And I'm like, I don't know, of course, it's for people who need it. Type <laughs> of thing. But, but all of a sudden, even making like nominally like amounts of money is so appealing when it's like Bitcoin. I'm like, wow, this is like quite the, this is quite the gift we're giving these people. And, you know, because it's, it actually, um, the devaluation of fiat lessens my interest in making money, which is kind of crazy. As you know, it's like, oh, like, 
I guess they just sent me $1,400. What am I going to do with it? And that, it's not that I don't need things like everybody else. And um, it's just my concept around money changed when it's like the valuable money, the mm. course of valuable money. And I'm like, oh, well, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to buy a Tesla. Who would buy a Tesla and Bitcoin? Like the Bitcoin is the thing you want to hold on to. Like use your trash money for that. You know, that shit comes easy. Man, that, that's actually such a really, really good point. Cause I had the same feeling as I was watching the kids like do that. I was like, fuck, I could do this I while this. I'm taking a shit on the toilet, you know, like earn some stats. But like what, what, what I'm measuring it internally in my head is like accumulating you yeah. know, a, a, a better money. Like I actually want to earn that. And, and, you know, you just literally articulated what my feeling earlier today was because I, I have the same feeling. It's like I've never drawn a large wage from any business that I've run. It's to, to date, you know, in Amber, like I'm the CEO and I'm one of the lowest paid, you know, staff in the, in the country, sorry, in the company. Like I, I don't, and I don't even get the same kick out of like earning a fiat wage and swapping it into Bitcoin. Like, you know, the, the like I, I, some publications and things like that that I write for at times, you know, sometimes pay me in Bitcoin. And that feeling is so much better. I'm like, fuck yes. I just own a bunch of sets. Like it's, it's yeah. very different. But thing. I didn't even know that I had that negative feeling or mm. the absence of regard for fiat money. Um, until today? Or well, like, until or... I had Bitcoin to compare yeah. it to, to be mm. like, oh, but this is like, I actually have like a thrill of like having it and like looking at, mm. you know, like Swan yeah. account and seeing, uh, seeing what I've Wild. been stacking. It's yeah. different, but but I never knew that I had that, um, I guess, apathy for money. But it's interesting. But it's yeah. because your whole system about money is designed around the, the whole infrastructure of culture and, and all of this. And, you know, I, I, I live in a very uh, decadent city where, you know, everybody will try to buy, your, uh, buy you out of your beliefs at any given moment. And so I just sort of had, I just sort of had negative feelings about money, but now I'm so re-inspired and I found, you know, these um, economists, I'm reading these finance books and, and I, there was nothing that was going to make me care about economics, nothing. You couldn't have met somebody that cared less about it. And then a crisis happened and then there was Bitcoin as, as one uh, solution on the table and and now I care so it's interesting and invigorating um, and scales my um, whole holes in my thinking about finance that I had never really acknowledged yeah well it's interesting money is value and I'm kind of curious if your values have changed over the last years the last year and and what are your values now well, they were really more unacknowledged. It mm. wasn't, it, I just, I went deeper into what I already believed, but there was nothing, like, I'm not mm. a, I, I don't have any, uh, you know, um, if influence in the world. What I think about a lot of stuff doesn't make, make any kind of impact on it. So I hadn't necessarily examined it beyond um, just my relationship with some beliefs, but it definitely firmed up some things that were unexamined. And you don't know that they really matter to you until you see the cause and effect yeah, or, of going against it or, or values the contrasting um, method that you, you believe in option A and you don't know that until option B takes the reins. And then you're like, holy shit, I really love option A and this is why I am. Now I have evidence to measure in my own life that's going on in my own country as to why this can't be what I believe. There was also no necessity to say on a soapbox and talk about what I believe. We were relatively just self-operating and minding our own business until this happened. Now I see all the writing on the wall looking back, but I didn't have anything personally um, inhibiting me and my movement until the shutdowns came, which is what woke me up. And I don't know what to do about the people that have been so deeply affected and they don't get it still. Mm, mm. What do, well, like, you don't want to get it, mm. I think. There's, um, did, did you ever, Cedric, did you ever read Bitcoin and Lockdowns when I wrote that last year? Like in August? I did read it. I think right before our show. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. So it was that like where I put the, the, the framework of, you know, Bitcoin adoption is, you know, don't worry about price, don't worry about time. Like it's just a function of, um, you know, need versus uh, want, right? So, so want on the left hand side, need on the right hand side, or luxury necessity, you know, uh, curiosity or pain, like you know. So, so, you know, 
Bitcoin is people come to it either because, you know, as I said, they're curious or that the pain sort of drives them so much. But I think to, to, to your point, what you were just saying, Jess, is, um, you know, you don't like I, I've always been relatively radical. But if I would say anything that's happened to me over the last 16 to 18 months is that I've been extremely radicalized. Like if you go back and look at my earlier pieces where I wrote like why Bitcoin matters and like, you know, earlier, earlier pieces, they're far more measured, you know, than me like, you know, talking about anthropological, you know, viewpoints of Bitcoin. These days I take a fucking baseball bat to society and I'm like, you know, burn the whole shit down and blah, blah, blah. So, so if there's anything that's happened is like similar to Jess is, you know, that those values have pre-existed for me, like freedom and growth, you know, and truth and integrity and all that sort of stuff. So they're sort of my highest, particularly freedom. And, you know, th this last 12 to 16 to 18 months, whatever it's been um, since the, you know, the stupidity first started, you know, blossoming is, is it's, you know, really made like it, it's, it's made it real why I value the things that I value. And it's the classic human condition. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. Right. So, you know, we all don't realize how important freedom is until it's fucking literally being robbed from you. And if you're, you're awake enough, you notice that. If you're a fucking lemming, you don't until you're in the gulag already. Um, and even then you're like, oh, no, no, it's okay. You know, we just, we're in the gulag. It's okay. We're safe here. Like, you know, so, some people are never going to fucking get it until they, you know, end up in the gas chamber. Um, At least the white supremacists can't get us in the gulag. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm really curious, Alex, how the last 12 to 16 months has maybe affected you in meat space, if at all. Or has this been a little bit more existential radicalization? And in what ways have you been even more radicalized? And, yeah. Yeah, a, li a little bit in meat space. Like, I mean, I I've honestly been arrested a couple of times uh, because I refuse to wear a mask, you know, like I've, you know, all, all sorts of shit like that. So, so there definitely is. Um, there's the, like, my disdain for lemmings and for morons, like, has, in, you know, increased to an incredible degree. Like, I used to have a lot more compassion for people. These days, like when I go into like a little fucking corner store and they're like, you know, you know, that whole little like, put your mask up, put your mask up. I'm like, I'll fucking uppercut you. Like, I'll break your fucking face. Like, that's how I feel about people now. So it's like, so the meat space side of things is definitely, um, my, my temper is a lot shorter. Um, and I, I, I'm just sick of these little, you know, mini fucking Gestapo little shits who, you know, have no other worth in life than to, act as the enforcers for stupidity like i just i just literally tweeted something while we we're sitting here you know it's called safety first which is a picture of a bunch of um when i when i landed in salvador like i was already raging about all the shit that i had to go through on the way in and then like i'm standing out there waiting for a fucking uber who took half an hour to find us but then i see like a uh, a pickup pickup truck with like 16 people fucking hanging off it like in the back but they've got masks on they must be safe and i was like you gotta be fucking kidding me. like am i what 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 looney tune fucking cartoon am i living in here so anyway I, I think yes existentially very much so um and uh the meat space i i've just really i, I i've this madness has pushed me to like my nerve endings have like shortened and my level of compassion is there's, like diminished. There's no uh, ignoring what's going on because it's in your face every day. So it's just exacerbated, uh, you know, annoyances you would be well justified to have had before. You just, you can't escape it yeah, in any yeah, kind yeah. of way. So it's risen in importance because you can't get away from it. And that's on purpose. And that's why I feel like um, this is a push to, to balkanize the country, to, to demonize. We're just going to, I don't know, what are we going to do? Have one victor side? Because then what they're going to do is just say, what do we do about the other half of the country that, that is the problem? They're evil and they, you know, this, like, oh. The, the, the beauty is, this, so, so their attempt to do that, though, is going to also be their undoing. Because what they're going to do is they're going to push all the productive and intelligent people out. And what they require, as much as they can play the funny game of printing money and borrowing from the future and everything, there needs to be a productive base to substantiate that. So as they move the productive base out and we, we sort of like move away, 
this time we are just lucky enough to have a economic network upon which we can you know continue to operate now it's going to be fucking hard for us and that's why i think this next 10 years are going to be difficult but these idiots are going to literally like they're going to rug pull themselves well that's the assault you're making um the assumption that people care about being productive in this country because i think one thing mm. that's happening since we're paying people to not work and also People have, have no problem with the slave labor that's happening about a detained group of people. I mean, a million people are detained in China for nothing other than, than their ethnic religious background, their ethnicity. Like, how, why would we keep doing, but, but people don't want to stop buying cheap plastic that they've made because um, what are we going to do? Motivate Americans who are getting $16 an hour to sit at home and do nothing? How much more do you have to pay other than $16 an hour to motivate them to go get a job? Because like you can't, our whole system, society is now getting comfortable with a system that only works because the Chinese people are essentially slaves, not just the, the uh, concentration camps that are, that are currently operating, but, but just the slave labor of how China treats their people, their, their working class. This is all unsustainable if they, um, and you know, that economic interdependence was quite intentional. It's been, been laid for, I don't know, 40 years, this, this intertwining that we have taken on. But for me, it's easy, like, and I love Bitcoin um, for the ability to, well, I'm hoping that other Bitcoiners, as entrepreneurial as we happen to be, that there's some way that I can start giving them my money, even my fiat money. Like, that's why we came to El Salvador and we, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, man that operates this is a Bitcoiner and, and is well Bitcoin networked. Because, like, if I'm going to go to vacation, if I'm going to go on vacation and I want to surf and I want to go to Central America, anyway, why not go and give my money to the people that share my values? Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that, you know, there will be Bitcoiners who are like, hey, guys, I opened up an Amazon store where I sell, you know, um, sandals. So at least I know, even though I have to participate with a stupid machine of, of um, consolidated uh, financial options in the marketplace, at least I can give it to a Bitcoiner or, you know, there are other small business or something. Like these are, these are uh, concessions I'm willing to make as a consumer. And I think that other people will be as well, which is why I'm not against the president having legally mandated it because somebody has to get the ball rolling yeah. You know, at least that's a that's like even though it's still like all government is heavy handed and, and uh, like government regulations are gross, right? But at least this is paving the way to make there be market options to where it's like not such an inconvenience to people that want to use Bitcoin because mm -hmm. now vendors are going to have that push forward. And I'm sure there's some the, some integration period, right? where before vendors have to take it. I'm sure it wasn't overnight. Right. So yeah, I, I mean, would love, I, I would love there to be more options for Bitcoiners, even if I'm just giving them like, yeah, I mean, like, why not? Share I hear you. Yeah, I, I think of tourism in a lot of ways or anyway, I spend my money, whatever form it is, uh, I want to give value to people that share my values. Um, yeah. in, in terms of, uh, you know, Pierre Shard mentioned on this show, it's like, um, I forgot that point. Uh, but Sorry. Alex mentioned that, you know, uh, borrowing from the future. And I think a lot about how, you know, fiat suppresses volatility everywhere. And, you know, Bitcoin reveals volatility. And, and I think there is a lot of volatility in the world. And that's why you see a lot of volatility in Bitcoin's price. And uh, one thing that's just sort of uh, very maybe a part of modernity is, you know, antidepressants and mental illness and antidepressants reduce volatility, I would think. And so I'm kind of curious, Jessica, what, what do you think about sort of the impact of uh, where, where America is psychologically, uh, you know, with mental illness or antidepressants or dealing with volatility and, and the real world? Yeah. Well, I talk about this online sometimes, and I, I was telling you a story just today about uh, some pushback I got um, about a tweet where I started off with, you're not depressed. You're just blocking yourself through this spiritual uh, sojourn that you need to be willing to understand and read your own cues. You don't need to numb yourself into a chemical oblivion so that you tolerate with how shitty that your, your 
life the existence is. is. I mean, yeah. with that situ- situational depression is, of course, different than uh, a chemical imbalance. And, and, and antidepressants save lives. And if you are on them by uh, some sort of medical directive for uh, uh, a predetermined period of time, that's obviously the proper use of it. I'm not saying that antidepressants are, are um, a bad thing innately, but they're, people are just living on them and make no plans to get off them, like all the substance. And so the, uh, part of the reason that we're dealing with a bunch of zombies is because they're, they're chemically a bunch of zombies. I, I, would, I would take it even further. I think um, you know, clinical depression is just learned situational depression you know, on, on, a, on a longer scale. So chemical imbalances are a function of uh, physiology. Like you change your physiology. Like if you take a depressed person who is clinically depressed and has a chemical imbalance, you drop them in front of a fucking lion and you unleash the lion, watch their whole physiology change and their entire fucking chemical balance go into survival mode where they need to fucking live. They, they will not be depressed anymore. Like th- th- there is no such, like depression is an act. It's not a fucking syndrome. But anyway, that's another complete. People don't want to be bothered to make changes about these things. And so we like to, we have this big movement to make a lot of excuses for people to be like, okay, well, they're that way because they have this emotional disorder. Well, they they could possibly change their diet, their exercise routine, um, the, the terrible relationship they're mm-hmm. in, the relationship mm-hmm. that they have with their own beliefs. So, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a reason that you have bad feelings about your own self-worth because it's your, it's, it's your inner voice telling you that maybe you're doing some things wrong that it, this isn't the best you could do for yourself. But nobody wants to be confronted with those things. They'd rather just tell me I am a bad person. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, you know, that point right there is so prescient because sadness or anger or frustration or, you know, feeling depressed due to those emotions is actually a signal that your body is, you know, your, your, your nervous system is telling you something's wrong, fix it. So instead of fixing it, what we're doing is we're actually removing the signal. So that, that's like driving in a car that's running out of fuel and saying, you know what? I'm just going to remove the fucking fuel gauge. There we go. I can't see that there's a problem, you know, or, or the fucking, the, the, the light that's showing the battery or something's mm. going to fucking fall off. Like it's literally, you know, or, or even a plane is probably a better example. It's like, you know, the, the, the gauge is saying you're about to crash, you're fucking falling. So it's like, I have an idea. Let's remove the altimeter <laughs> and we're okay. That's literally what these fucking antidepressants are. That's what the fiat monetary system is. It's the same thing. It's like, there's a fucking problem. You know, people are unemployed. Let's give them money. They're not feeling the consequences of their decision, which is so enraging in Los Angeles because I can, I get it now. I get, I just, I see it. The reason that they can't have any changes is because they're blocked from the consequences Fuck yeah. about the people. Like yep. every time the federal government bails out the state of California, that's so bankrupt and all that, you know, and they have all these reasons you know what and and then they get the, these payouts and so then the Californians never feel the consequences of voting for people like Gavin Newsom so i don't know how the recall's going to go i can't wait to vote to recall him and uh, vote for probably Rick Ronell in his place so um i uh, but california is just it's it's such a vivid example like i said earlier about i feel so lucky because i get to feel it all full strength because i live in the uh, craziest state in the union for all of this stuff it's a, like a, i just downloaded it all really quickly because of my environment and somebody in mississippi isn't going to understand what's the, you know broken about the system the way that i got to experience it at ground zero right. but people should stop blocking their their uh, consequences and you're blocking the signals in your own emotional systems based on the values that you hold um, that's antidepressants and the bailouts and the money printing, like he said, it's all the same thing. You're blocking the consequences. Yep. And so no wonder people become addicted to the, the, the crutches that are available to them. The money printer, the antidepressants, whatever, not, you know, the people that abuse substances, whatever they happen to be, they're, they're all just blocking you from the reality that you're doing something wrong because nobody wants to go through the emotional work of figuring out what that happens to be because they have to make hard decisions. They have to change things. Right. They don't want to change. Yeah. Well, in terms of that, how are levels of consciousness like floors in a building in Manhattan? 
Mm -hmm. How? Well, um, there are there are coping mechanisms that we have when we are young before we have gone through these things, living at a lower floor of consciousness. Uh, that become we 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 feel finally the consequences of living this way, and so we shed these behaviors and we ascend up levels in this building. And you get to have improved visions and views of everything that you see, but it costs more because now you can't go back to those, you can't go back to those crutches of coping mechanisms and substances that you use while you were living in the basement because that's basement dwelling stuff where you didn't, you know, you didn't make these good decisions that earned you the right to move up. And, and so you can never go, like, like say, you can never go back home. You can never go back to these descending floors. Or if you do, it's very depressing and you're very aware that something is wrong, that you have fallen off completely. Because um, you, you, you don't allow yourself. Once you've ascended in consciousness, you can't go back. You can't unknow what you've learned. You can't unlearn it. You can't unsee it. That's why I know I'm, I can never give my vote back to people that alienated me so deeply on every level. That would be me going back down into conscious darkness where I just trusted that the government had my best intentions and at hand all these things that would be descending in the levels of awareness so um, i i feel um that you you ascend in levels based on all the new discoveries about yourself and the world around you and uh it, it's just life experiences that that lift you up into these other realms of seeing things interesting yeah, I just have a couple more questions. I'm kind of curious, Jessica, how is the fight game? I know you're a big MMA fan. How is the fight game analogous to all of life? Oh, wow. That's a good one. Um, the fight game is analogous to all of life. Um, I, I love fighters because um, they have to, they're always self-made for one thing. I mean, it's based off your talent and, and your, um, your own drive to succeed and your dedication. And uh, it, it just shows you about overcoming the odds, um, the fact that you have to give up all these things and make these sacrifices in life. There's so many, there's so many beautiful lessons to learn from like boxers and mixed martial artists. I've, I've been out of that world for a year and a half now because of the shutdowns and it, it makes me sad. So I feel like you pulled out uh, vintage Jessica Vaughn there on that one. Yeah. Well, I was just kidding. I mean, I heard you were a big fight fan. It's kind of interesting yeah. that, you know, just, uh, I was kind of just curious why you were drawn to it so much and, and um, what we can learn from that. And I'm, my final question for both of you is, you know, how is Bitcoin hope for each of you in, in your own lives? going forward? Hmm. I mean, do you have an answer for that first? I need to ruminate. Um, I needed something that uh, complemented the acknowledgements that I had made in the red pill, right? So the orange pill is what uh, brought me up. Uh, so the hope I get is that hit every day the community and the thoughts that people have randomly that are in the Bitcoin community and they just tweet them and it's a constant drip. It's a support system to remind me that there are so many believers in a system that I believe in where people are working towards solutions mm. based on shared values that I have. So it, it's, it's hope so much, but it's also just the daily drip of the same hope that is the whole reason I bought Bitcoin, but it's reminders of what we're working for. It's reminders like seeing the, Seeing the actual people that are actually going to earn the earn the um, Bitcoin doing these tasks and everything that, that we have built, watching it get enacted here, it, it's just I want to make it real. So that's why I came and visited. There's so there's so much hope in, in Bitcoin, but the fact that there's just shared space of individuals that I can bring into my life, because by the way, I emptied my life of almost everybody and everything that ever means anything to me. So Bitcoin is hope in the way that I can build community going forward and um, put every piece of my life together. And, and Bitcoin is, is the glue that's making that possible for me because it was so dramatic for me of 
what I gave up. Do you think you'll ever reconnect or gain back what you gave up in some ways in terms of personal relationships? Do you think in the future things can be mended? They're not necessarily. I'm not necessarily saying I literally mm, no, I get okay. my phone and delete it. It's just that I don't share those interests anymore. So even though they might call right. me, I'm not compelled to call them back. These kinds of things. I, I don't share that interest anymore. I'm not going to those spaces anymore. I don't shop at those stores anymore. Right. It's all, but the illusion has been shattered for me. And, and because I am, you know, and I'm leaving California. I mean, that's going to just move in states. Like I don't have to, I don't have to react to anything. Is this the first time you've life. moved since you left Kansas? Um, no, I've lived in Georgia. I lived in Florida for a while. Okay. Uh, I left when I graduated college and went on into the big world. But um, yeah, but I don't see myself going back. Anybody that fell off, you know, my favorite poet Rumi has this uh, saying that let the dead leaves drop. And that's just life. That's just change. That's the evolution. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not so tethered to anybody or anything that I was going to block my ability like it, it weighs you down it keeps you in those basement levels of consciousness all like all these attachments to these friends that i had made in la or these you know business alliances or these things that once mattered so much none of that matters more than me living authentically aligned with my beliefs so no i'm not going to go out of my way Fair enough. if it naturally if it naturally happens what i'm hoping is that some people will maybe remember everything that they liked about me and you know, found me to be a reasonable person or whatever our common ground was and to, they'll possibly listen to what i have to say because they'll remember their personal experience that's what i'm and really maybe, getting at maybe they'll see where you're coming curious. from yeah perhaps and then i can be there because i went before them to pull them up and guide them in this way um so i'm not saying that it, like obviously people change do you do you have a uh, let's say i mean you've changed i guess i, I hate to use the yeah. word changed you know whatever but you've had gone through this period of transformation and transition do you have empathy for the version of yourself before this and for those people who haven't embarked on the changes you have based on the signals in the world it's the only thing that makes me not think that the majority of people in this country are bad because I was just one. And, and, and so, like I said, anytime I think that I'm so smart and that I get all these things that other people are just so dumb, they don't get. I remember what a personal invitation Gavin Newsom had to give me so that I could understand the bigger picture. And so maybe more people need that, which is why I'm so against the blocking of consequences in their life. Like, no, people need to feel the policies of Gavin Newsom. They need to feel like the policies of Gretchen Whitmer killing your grandma by putting sick people in the nursing homes when they, you know, they, they need to feel the consequences of these decisions so that they stop voting for those people. It's the only hope that we have about, uh, I think this government is so, the structure of our country and the government is so broken anyway. I don't think we can necessarily fix it by voting for different people. I think we're that should be sailed. Um, but, I, but. Yeah, I hear you. Alex? Yeah. Um, I was trying to think and listen to Jess at the same time. And being a guy, I can't multitask. So I failed miserably. So let's just try this. Is like, I, I, the hope that Bitcoin gives me for the world is that it's a, it's a way, it's a way for those of us who have some drive and some, you know, chutzpah in life to, to exit, you know, the, the sludge and the slavery and the stupidity, you know, that we're sort of seeing the world uh, decay into. And for me, you know, I, I, the older I get, the more selective I get. Like, you know, th this morning I was speaking with a young guy and I was just saying, well, you know, the older you get, the more closed-minded you become. And if you become... In, you know, intelligently closed-minded in the sense you find first principles and you can build off those. You can, you can very quickly eliminate the noise and find the signal. And, and I think 
we live in a world of so much fucking noise and so little signal when you sort of discover the signal and you, you realize you want to be with specific people you want to you want to do things in specific ways and you, you don't want to go around and like fucking rob and shoot people like you, you want to do your own thing and you don't you just want morons to get out of your fucking way and yeah. for me what i love about you know bitcoin is it's going to usher in you know my, my long-term hope for bitcoin is going to usher in a world of I kind of call it, you know, um, feudal meritocracies, you know, like, yeah. I, I think we're going to have the rise of nations, like, not, not, sorry, not nations, we're going to have the rise of like, um, corporate monarchies, basically. And, mm. you know, where, where you have competition amongst, you know, people who want to run things in particular ways, and you have like a whole patchwork of that, where, you know, you can move to, you know, where is more competitive and what you like. And, and, you know, one of the things I've, kind of enjoyed is like i don't enjoy the traveling process particularly over the last 18 months because it's a fucking nightmare anyway time you go somewhere but I, I like going and experiencing a new place or a new culture or something like that so in the future i kind of see like in the next 10 20 years or whatever we'll, we'll have the ability to move around in these you know city states that have different cultures and different values and different things like you know amsterdam is the classic you know that people can sort of you know associate with you go to amsterdam to get fucking high and you know have mushrooms and all that sort of stuff amsterdam is an, is an example of a of a type of charter city state mm -hmm. that may mm -hmm. exist in the future and, and bitcoin makes that um possible so so you know it doesn't it doesn't mean we're going to solve every human problem like we're going to fight we're going to argue we're going to not fucking like each other you know all that sort of stuff is going to exist but you'll have optionality and what we're missing in the world today is optionality we're, we're being all herded towards you know illusions of choice but we don't really have any choice with lots of things correct it's, it's such a fucking scam so so i you know i feel like bitcoin will re-enable choice re-enable competition you know reintroduce the specter of economic reality such that you know that there is no camouflaging the consequence of a bad decision or a bad action um and you know i i relish a world in which you know that kind of responsibility comes back up because then you know then those of us who want to progress can progress those who don't fuck they don't have to you know and but they don't they can't fucking bring me down in the process so i'm excited for people to see that bitcoin shows that there's chinks in the armor of the system that you think that this there's just these um power structures in place and that there's no getting around it but bitcoin shows that you know our human ingenuity and and cooperate opting in with cooperative efforts that we can make alternatives to the intervention of huge government in your daily life like we we can do so much better have you been vaccinated yet <laughs> it's like fucking knocking on your door <laughs> yeah, don't come to my house. <laughs> yeah well I, I don't believe anyone can actually multitask but i do believe that the two of you have a shit ton of chutzpah uh, I do love choice and optionality, and I really believe in that. I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. I'm really excited for the both of you to uh, enjoy El Salvador and all it offers, and I hope you guys have a blast. Please let everyone know where they could find you guys, and if you have any parting words, the, the mic is you know for both of you. Well, you can follow me mostly on Twitter because I'm such a Twitter person, but um, Jessica Vaughn and Vaughn is spelled V-A-U-G-N. So please follow me. Yeah, I'm on officially these days Ghost of Svetsky, S V E T S K I. My old account is gone. That's um, ridiculous. I'm I may bring it back. Let's see. Let's see what happens. I, I, I'm working on something in the background. Right, the choice is yours. I kind of like the legendary move to the ghost of Svetsky at this point. Well, if Twitter forces your hand, it's kind of like embracing the word toxic or maximalism, whatever it is. Like uh, but, you know, I don't know all the things going on in, in your life and what happened there. So, you know, whatever well, you I, it's yeah, I, I, I may have a wild card to 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 bring back the original uh, thing. But, you know, I'll keep that private for now. But, yeah, it's it's officially it's, it's actually banned from Twitter. It's officially banned. And, you know, technically it's not supposed to come back, but I may be able to pull a string. But other than that, yeah, my medium and I write on Bitcoin magazine now. So Bitcoin magazine is kind of like my my core blog now so if people mm. just search for me plus bitcoin magazine they'll see where i release my new articles there's one that is about to go live in the next couple of days which is called the intelligent person's guide to bitcoin 
which is a rebuttal to this um, idiot economist down in Australia who wrote the, the Dummies Guide to Crypto. Um, and, you know, his whole thesis was basically, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies are volatile, so you should be careful when you're investing. Like, just, you know, just the classic moronic fucking shit that, you, you know, drivel that you hear from like an anchor just coming out of an economist's mouth. So anyway, I'm going to keep writing, uh, keep podcasting on Wake Up and, um, and keep tweeting until I get banned again. And if you're yeah. following or if you're watching this podcast uh, for me, then I recommend his pieces about um, how Bitcoin uh, parallels the, the Jordan Peterson mm. um, 12 Rules for Life. Um, as you, if you follow me, you know that I'm a big Jordan Peterson believer. So uh, it's really cool to see how you um, made those comparisons and, and how Bitcoin follows those beliefs, which was pretty inspiring for me. So I recommend that piece. Thank you. Awesome. This has been so dope, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for such brother. a good interview. That was great. Jessica Vaughn and Alex Vetsky on Bitcoin Beach, Truth, Freedom, Hutzpah, and Letting the Dead Leaves Drop straight from El Salvador, right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And thank you for listening. If you dig the show, make sure to subscribe, share, and rate with five stars. Stack sats, stay humble, and be a strong-handed, unique beast. This is Cedric. Peace.